So, excellent. Well, thank you. Thanks for coming, guys. Sure, yeah. definitely. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Thank you for inviting us. Yeah. Uh, we will see now a tour of uh, the Space Museum, private Space Museum of Steve Jurvetson. And it's all exciting. It's all <laughs> exciting. <laughs> thank you. Man. We also know each other uh, for many years of launching rockets together out in the Black Rock Desert. It's uh, a tradition we've had now for probably over a decade. And uh, it's fantastic to be able to share some of these artifacts from the past. Uh, what we'll see today includes a part of every lunar module that's been on the moon and brought back uh, as a souvenir, contrary to protocol. Um, <laughs> incredible engines around us we'll start with that uh, launched some of the earlier missions, uh, Mercury, Gemini, and what have you. And, uh, and then some modern stuff as well, both um, <laughs> wreckage and success from the SpaceX uh, programs, everything from reusable flight to uh, parachute hatch from their first human flight, um, and a bunch of stuff in between. Some you know, rocks from the moon, rocks from Mars, uh, equipment that was used in the Viking program to uh, first try to detect life on Mars. So yeah. hopefully it'll be interesting for you all. Not stuff you get to see every day, right? That's right. <laughs> That's what I hope. Yeah, so we're, we're here, by the way, at the Future Ventures office. I've turned the office into a space museum. Every nook and cranny, as you'll soon see, it's exciting. Is, is full of stuff. Yeah, okay. super exciting. Okay, awesome. uh, I'm stepping it all behind the camera. Okay, great. All right. Okay. We'll just start this way and walk. Yes. And I'll, and I'll be brief here, and then we'll spend a little more time in that conference room and on the Viking stuff when we come out. All right, should we start? Yes. Great, so here we are at the entrance. We are greeted by our TR-201, which is a lunar module descent engine derivative. This literally is the engine design that landed us on the moon. It is very simple up top because it just mixes two fluids that combust upon contact called hypergolics. And the entire inner liner is ablative, meaning a lot of human effort, a lot of engineering challenge. Turned out SpaceX started this way and gave up on ablative liners and went for regenerative cooling but it's basically an insulator that keeps the bell from melting when you go. Mm -hmm. Other rocket engines, like these two, actually all three of these, all the ones we're gonna see, are regeneratively cooled, meaning you put the fuel into a turbo pump and up through all of these little pipes. This is an X-15 engine, one of the fastest, or still the fastest airplane, rocket airplane ever. Now this is what it looked like for people who remember the X-15, a piece of wreckage from one of them. <laughs> and this is a very modern engine, this is from Astra, which is recently uh -huh. yep. flew out of Kodiak. It's 3D printed from yep. top to bottom, yep. but it also has channels built into it. So the fuel comes in, comes up, runs through these channels and keeps this simple metal from, this is ink and all, but still keeps the super alloy from melting under the, sure. the heat of, like it's hotter than the sun. Yeah, when that's right. When it's under flight. This is a Russian scramjet engine. This is part of a Russian space station that came back ballistic, basically deorbited. It was supposed to crash in the ocean, instead landed in Argentina. It was one of these spheres, a titanium sphere attached to a Salyut 7 space station. What for? Um, well, it was used to, uh, to probably to store helium, but uh, it was just part of the structure. And this is all like, like a meteorite scorched from entry. Yeah. Coming in. Wow. Coming in hot. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Yep. So then, and, and mm -hmm, it's yeah. interesting how it doesn't, you know, it, uh, all the damage is in lo one local yes. zone. You would think in the process of re-entry, yeah. yeah. There was, there is, um, let me see if I can feel it on this one, a, a thing on the other side that had oriented, meaning each of these spheres had a spigot. Mm -hmm. And that t t acted like it wasn't a Like a drag spigot. device? It was like, it was like a tail. Yeah. It's yeah. like a tail yeah, cone. Yeah. It, would, it was pointing forward, and any slight tilt, it would flip to the back. Huh. And so I kept one side oriented down huh. uh, during my entry. Yeah. Almost like a, an arrow, right? To some degree. Yeah. Although a much different environment. <laughs> exactly. So let's get these. These are a bunch of um, at, uh, both Mariner and Lunar Module and Saturn V valve packages, the things that put fuel into the engine that got more complex when it's more than just. Actually, in this case, it, it was just two fuels. This is actually kind of an amazing little story. This is the equivalent of what we saw earlier. You just got to mix two fluids. This is what gets you off the moon. So this would be connected to a big bell. But it is incredibly complex, all electrically actuated with redundancies. And when I, the one time I ever met uh, Neil Armstrong, and I asked him just out of the blue what he most worried about in Apollo 11, he said it was this, this thing, thing, that when he pushes the button to get off the moon, wah, 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 nothing happens. <laughs> and like... He said he had nightmares about that for months prior to Apollo 11. And yeah. I asked, is it because it was going to fail? And he's like, no, it's just like, imagine that scenario. Yeah. You just succeeded, yep. you're ready to go home, and you can't. And, yeah. there's no, and there's no possibility of rescue. Wow. And then you can imagine, in your mind, you play through, what would you do? Yeah, right. The contingency. Go for a walk, <laughs> you know, take Buzz's air. I don't want to <laughs> so let's walk around the corner in here. We'll work our way around. Um, we call this the Lunar Orbiter Room because... It has a bunch of artifacts 
from the Lunar Orbiter Program. This model reminds people what that was. Mm -hmm. It was this spacecraft with four solar panels. This is one of those solar panels, to give you a sense of scale. And it took the first high resolution images of the moon. We were prospecting landing sites for Apollo. Mm -hmm. So this is from 1966. These tiny little solar cells were state of the art back then. From and, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And what was their efficiency? <laughs> Very low, right? <laughs> Even though they're operating in space, which is pretty good. Yeah. Um, in general, the Apollo program consumed half of all global semiconductor output. So this whole newfangled thing of semiconductors, solar cells, uh, it was a big amount of that was consumed by the uh, space program. So this, this is kind of an amazing spacecraft in that it had an analog film lab internally. So they flew around orbit around the moon, took photos, and developed a film like literally that you do like in a dark room, yeah. and then beam the data back to Earth, this is the high gain antenna, uh, by, by using a television-like screen or camera on the film. Yeah. So I have in here a spare of that high gain antenna. Wow. The kind of image you get where there's all these strips because uh -huh. as you're orbiting around the moon, uh -huh. you're taking film as uh -huh. you go and then beaming it back to Earth. And I also have the low gain antenna over there. So solar cell and then two antennas. The reason I love this story is only now had the original high resolution images been shared with the world. Back in 1966, every photo that NASA shared was downgraded. They Why took a that? photo of a photo because they didn't want the Soviets to, to know, know how long they were spying. Yeah. Because there was no atmospherics. Yeah. Good. Like, whatever you could resolve told you the Crystal resolution clear. Yeah. of our spy camera yeah, optics yeah, yeah. and it was right. much better than we wanted to let them know. Huh. Now Russia at that same time, remember we saw like, that thing that deorbited that yes. tank? Yes, the Titanic. They ball. had two secret military space stations in orbit at that time, meaning they said they're just doing science, but they had a machine gun on them. They fired the machine gun in space. What? And it fired a machine gun in space at their own target to show they could in like the recoil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Terrible. Right. <laughs> like they're thinking everyone's arming up, they better put a machine gun on, on two stations. And they had this thing on there, which is um, basically, it looks like something from, from a submarine. Yeah. You, you use this joystick to, to point at things you want to take photos of, Inside of this column were uh, a series of mirrors that would track the precise orbital period, so you can, sort of, in a sense, spend some time over a region like like a U.S. airbase. Okay. Okay. And take photos. You have two different lenses, wide angle. I mean, it, eyepieces rather. Mm -hmm. and, and basically, they're taking pictures of U.S. airbases. Uh -huh. Where if you want to copy something like the space shuttle to the centimeter, which they did, mm -hmm. to the centimeter, mm -hmm. you want high resolution images of those aircrafts. Because yeah. if you don't have good computers and simulation, it's much easier to copy than to build from scratch, right? Like the wind tunnel test, right. all, all the yeah. like Just, we know it flies, build it to the same ratio. Sure. So it's super important to get the measurements right. So you know and this you, was the most mm -hmm. effective way for them to yeah. get oh, yeah. the imagery. So they, yeah. they would develop the film in an orbiting space station, drop it in canisters when they were over Russia, and they would be caught before they hit the ground by a passing aircraft. And that's how they, so we were doing the and spy they were, plane. They, they were able sport. to do that. Mm -hmm. We were doing the U-2 spy plane. They were doing uh, two militarized, Spy space stations. Yeah, payload from space, mm -hmm. and they caught it. Mm -hmm. So you wow. know what the U.S. did on some of our really important uh, air bases, where you have these brand new aircraft that you know you don't want them measuring. They're like, hmm, how the cars will park underground? How are they going to know what the scale is of something? Mm -hmm. So they made all of the baseball fields slightly wrong. The distance from home plate to first base yeah. is because like, yeah. you need a reference. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I just figured that's probably what the Russians will use because that is like the exact thing and they're actually incorrect. <laughs> wow. Big because, head, because we know they're going to spy on us. What, if we were looking at our own imagery, what would we use to, as a reference point for yeah. distance? Let's yeah. make the baseball diamonds wrong. Yeah. I mean, the baseball field wrong. Do, do they know if that worked in the end? We don't know. No. We, oh. I guess that would make sense we would know, right? We do know that they spent more money. Uh, on the Buran than anything else they've ever done in the Soviet Union. It was probably the stick that broke their back. That should be a good transition because I have some Buran stuff here. Um, just as a reminder, that could, you know, the control panel and air, air purifying, uh, basically the same thing as the, the, the scrubber, the CO2 scrubbers that mm -hmm. we have for mm -hmm. Apollo over there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's crazy. So, so yes. quick question. Mm -hmm. Was yeah. the titanium ball an indicator for the fact that the Russians were indeed using those no, it's not clear because their science mission space station was very similar from the outside. Yeah. The things that were different were what's on the inside, the, the spy stuff, and the machine gun. Okay. But the, they leveraged the core design, uh, you know, the, 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 let's say the air handling equipment. Because the other ones were humans on board, supposedly doing science. Right, right. Okay. Interesting. So very some other firsts of the world. The first 
flown sextant uh, with these baffles to protect it on the Apollo program. This actually flew on AS-202, basically before there was even the Apollo 1 um, fire. They, we, uh, we flew you know, some of the uh, optics that would be used for star sighting yeah. and uh, orientation. Then over here, we have some amazing things. This is a spare. I just was researching this again recently. Um, of the Luna 9, my daughter's named Luna, so I love this. It was the first soft lander on the moon. The first lander on any or I mean, celestial body. Yeah. The first time we operated a spacecraft on another world was by Russia in 1966. This thing landed, inflated an airbag-like thing, bounced on the moon, uh -huh. just, like, just like we did later on Mars. Uh -huh. And then the beauty of this design is these four petals unfold, I'm putting the airbag down, orienting by definition up. Okay. It, and so the four it, petals are the parabolic dish to beam the data back. For the first from the yeah. from the inside. Yeah. Well, actually, let me show you uh, from this book. This is a book by the guy who ran the program, mm -hmm. and uh, it took the first photo from the surface of of uh, the moon. Let's see. Where's the opening? Well, that's examples of the photos. Somewhere in here, though, is a drawing. Uh, I forgot where it is. Well, shoot. <laughs> oh, there it is on the cover. This is good enough. So when it lands, these four petals opened, mm -hmm. and even though it's not complete, mm -hmm. this is like a parabolic dish. And these are the antennas, and this yeah. is a rotating panoramic camera. So it literally took the first photos in the moon. But what's amazing, and not many people know, is that those photos were not shared by Russia. They were intercepted in the UK, and a British tabloid was the first to publish that there was a photo on the surface of the moon. It was wow. in a British tabloid. Wow. Yeah. And then the Russians admit, and they actually <laughs> yeah. admitted it, and, sure. and, yeah, and they, they said, yep, that was us. Wow. Um, that must have been a fine for the, the, the guy who did that. Yeah, exactly. No, it was like, it was an uh, incredible effort. Now, Mars is all over our mind because of perseverance right now. This is some incredible historical artifacts here. Um, the entire scientific payload to detect life on Mars first flew, this, these particular ones, first flew in 1976 on the Viking lander. Mm -hmm. uh, some may remember it sort of sent back images like this. It wasn't a rover, it landed in one place, it had an arm that would reach out, grab some Martian soil, drop it in what looks like a little flower petal thing. This, you know, this would open up. They were funnel. And uh, <laughs> then it would come down through uh, a series of soil distribution and, and stirring mechanisms, and then it was distributed to all these instruments that would do a tag release. They would basically add radioactive carbon-14 to see if the potential microbes living on Mars were actually we're processing carbon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They did three or four different experiments. It had a gas chroma chromatograph mass spectrometer in it. It had all this incredible stuff, all within this tiny box, yeah. built by TRW, by the way. And this, these are the circuit boards here, and, and, and all the handlers, like, it's insane. It's all made out of platinum and gold and palladium. It, it outperformed any commercial mass spec machine at the time. And they fit it all in this tiny box. Yeah, and those machines are not small. No, they're huge. Yeah, that's right. Wow. And uh, and only recently has there been some controversy, not or at least scientific revisiting of the data, because if you all remember, it was like big disappointment, no life on Mars. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons they could say that definitively back then, they thought definitively, was there were like, almost no carbon molecules or complex carbon yeah. molecules of any kind, uh -huh. even less so than you find on the Moon, which is like a death, death lifeless place, right? Yeah. Very weird. Recently, in a separate mission, we found there's a ton of perchlorates in the soil. And we all know as rocket people, perchlorates are somewhat nasty chemicals. It turns out all of the sample processing here raised the temperature at least 200 degrees centigrade, in some cases as high as 800 degrees centigrade, huh. that releases all these perchlorates and destroys all yeah. carbon-based molecules yeah. and leaves this weird signature behind of other chemicals that yeah. we did detect on all the Viking landers. So it is possible that because we didn't know about the perchlorates, we destroyed the possibility of ever finding yeah. with this instrument set. Right, right. right. And so there's some, huh. there, the conclusion by some is that it's inconclusive. Yeah, yeah. Right. There may be microbial life. Just right. everywhere on Mars, we have yet to find out. Yeah. We'll find out hopefully with that. And so that's why on uh, the current missions, they have to keep that canister for a return so clear, mm -hmm. so clean, right? It's, exactly. You can't pre-contaminate with anything. Right? That's right. Because yeah. that, that package of stuff, if it gets exposed even to our concentration of oxygen on Earth, which is very different than on Mars, all kinds of crazy stuff could start happening. Yeah. Yep. Wow. You could have this oxidative uh, reaction. Yeah. This is the this in here is a uh, example of another mass spec. There are actually three that flew on each Viking lander. Um, this is this area here. There's a hydrogen gas that gets um, a little pin breaks it and it flows across. Inside of here is the 
is the uh, mass spectrometer. This is a gas chromatograph column with various places of absorbing. They tried to remove all the carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide out because they knew there was tons of that. They wanted to look for the more, um, you know, like oxygen and krypton and, and more uh, obscure materials. Is it is that uh, one box gold plated? Yeah, there, I mean, sure, there's, there's, there's a lot of platinum. I have a lot of gold. Everything's gold plated. I mean, I've, they, it, part it's of it internal is, to you know. Yeah, it's non non-reactive. I believe yeah. it's the main reason. Um, so that it's not giving off anything, mm -hmm. uh, it, but I don't know in this case why it's gold plated huh. in this in this particular case. Okay. Um, well, a quick little aside. <laughs> this is a this is a really cool piece. <laughs> <laughs> this is Mars rock. Not um, every day you get a touch yeah. and or a hold. Yeah, here you go. Yeah. Mars rock. That's right. It looks just like what you'd see on Mars. It came as a meteorite, and we know that it's from Mars initially from isotope analysis. They look at ratios of a variety of elements in the periodic table and each planet and, and 150 different moons in our solar system have a unique signature of these isotope ratios which fall on this fractionation line. Mm -hmm. So they were like, yep, this is from Mars. But then recently people did a separate analysis on a meteorite much like this where they were drilled into a little trapped air bubble inside of it, looked at the gas in there and it was a perfect match to the Martian atmosphere mm -hmm. that was studied on Viking. Mm -hmm. So Viking got the data from the surface. This and has little trapped air bubbles of that air. Yeah. And it's incredible. I mean, these Martian meteorites are more rare than pure crystal and diamond on Earth. And this is one of the few that has the trapped Martian air inside of it, yeah. in addition. Yeah. To yeah. That is an amazing piece. Well, thank you. A little mission control stuff, Gemini blockhouse, used uh, you basically throughout Apollo and also space shuttle, you know, like those old. Photos like on Apollo 13, you know, where they're in front of, in front of <laughs> yeah. the stuff. It's, yeah. it's incredible, right? Right. Um, what, what is this piece right here? Oh, this is a piece of. They would often put things like this. Is uh, that it, it's, a, it's a, it's a um, heat, heat shield. Yeah. Yeah. yeah exactly. So it's scarred uh -huh. on the top. Uh -huh. It was used in Gemini 8, which was Neil Armstrong's like first, actually second heroic space move. His first was in X-15. Yeah. This is the one where the, the capsule had a, a stuck thruster and he had the wherewithal to avoid spinning to literally black out yeah. to try to manually compensate it, yeah. and get it back and under control yeah. to figure out what was, what wow. was going wrong. Wow. But yeah, this is a, I got the side of, like basically they start off looking clean like this. Mm -hmm. This is a test block from, this, from uh, Apollo. Is this phenolic based? Uh, yeah, the, the, um, exactly. This, this webbing, mm -hmm. this hex webbing is like a, like a fiberglass and they have a person manually fill each of these on the spacecraft. It was not manually. Really, manually. What do you have to do manually? It's kind of crazy. Uh -huh. um, yeah, so wow. it wasn't like a block you put on. This was a <laughs> test block. And the reason they made test blocks is that if they ever had a problem, they wanted to figure out was the the mix that day bad? Was the was the operator screwing uh -huh. it up? So they uh -huh. would do one of these just to be able to do quality control checks on yeah. what was permanently, the fact, yeah. permanently <laughs> attached to the spacecraft. <laughs> yep, exactly. And then, uh, wow. And then as Apollo goes, this is like that same exact thing scorched in this case from Apollo 10. That's, that shows you how much more you could have gotten. Like yeah. that's the, With the buffer. Factor of uh, yes. Exactly. Yeah, factor looks, of like, looks like a, a 5X <laughs> factor of safety there. And Steve, mm -hmm. you loaned this uh, console to the movie industry here? That's right. It was used in the movie Apollo 13. Uh -huh. So this exact console is in, in the movie. In fact, all of the electronics, uh, you can sort of see from the side here, are intact. I'm going to try to power it up with some low voltage drivers and get all these lights to blink again. <laughs> that would, be, that would to be very yeah. impressive. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when failure is not an option. Oh my gosh, this is, this is one of the newest things and kind of crazy. I'm ex super excited about this. Okay. So this panel is from, I'll take, I'll t pull it out so you can see how flimsy it is, is from Sigma 7, which is one of the Mercury spacecrafts. Wally Shira flew to space. Uh, this is what held it to the, to the sides. It yeah. had some sensors on it. Yeah. This literally is the logoed, just as a reminder, what we're talking about here. Ah, sorry. Oh, that, that logoed piece that was hand painted by CC. Um, yeah, that right there, yeah huh? exactly. Yeah. Sigma 7. Wow. And they took it, that panel off, cut off a portion off the top to study it for, you know, what damage it took in space. Because remember, this is like the first humans in space in the US space program. Yeah. Like, is there micrometeorite damage? Is there. You know what? Radiation. Yeah, what, exactly. Yeah. What, it, it, so the the lab that did the work got to keep it, which is kind of astounding to me, and uh, that's why I know. It ended it. up here, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, even more amazing, or less, depending on your point of view, equally amazing, let's just say, is that uh, it, this will hopefully 
be published soon because there's an incredible expert doing work as we speak on this <laughs> to show that this camera that I have was on that mission, the first Hasselblad camera in space. I know your dad is a big fan of lenses and is a medium format yeah. camera. Wally himself personally purchased two of these cameras, gave one to himself and one to Gordy Cooper to fly in these early missions to take the first good photographs taken by humans in space yeah. with uh, the original eyesight. Oh, with Velcro. Oh, yeah, Velcro, exactly. We'll come back to Velcro. Velcro is very common in the space program pri prior to Apollo 1 fire, exactly. Um, but, yeah, they, they, they pulled off all the, the leather mm -hmm. that was normally on the outside, and so all the scratch marks are very unique and indicative of which unit is which, and, the, and of course the serial numbers. And so is that how the, the letters, this expert is Directly from Ali Shira. Yeah. Is, this how, is mm -hmm. that how the expert is attempting yes. to... Everything. Oh my god, he knows everything about it. Like, is this screw half yeah. turned or fully turned? <laughs> it was incredible. They did a bunch of modifications for space use. Uh, so they, you know, gutted this, rebuilt certain parts. Mm -hmm. Did like this whole eyepiece was a custom build. Mm -hmm. um, like he was like, is that circle there? Is this part plastic or metal? Like every aspect of it um, dictates. And the only thing we're not 100 percent sure of is that this lens got swapped out because after the flights, the Air Force Receiving Lab that gave these things back to the original owners may have swapped out the lens. We're not sure on that, but we are sure on the rest of the, the camera frame, body. Yeah, yep, the exactly. Of okay, let's move along. Oh, oh we're good, we're out of time. Okay, so we have a bunch of, I love panels, you know, from the lunar module. Oh, this is kind of cool. Uh, I like things that are also flown in space. So this, <laughs> this headset under the Snoopy cap, as they call it, uh -huh. uh, that, you know, and this would be on top of it, you know, like the, by the way, this is not glass. This is, Oh, awesome. yeah. Yeah. Wow. yeah, yeah, this is pretty unbreakable. It's kind of interesting. Um, so that goes on top of this. This, unbelievably, not only has gone to the moon, not only got on the surface of the moon, but was in on their head as they drove around an electric car on the moon for the first time in Apollo 15. So this is the Apollo 15 That's headset used by Jim Irwin, and that normally isn't available. Everything in the Apollo spacesuit genre is like special, and like you won't find. Neil Armstrong's glove mm -hmm. or any of this stuff in a private collection. Mm -hmm. This got repurposed and studied for Skylab. So they deassessed officially. So it is no longer an Apollo 15 artifact. It is now a Skylab artifact because they're trying to see if they could reuse it. Okay. And so when that program was done, it, then it did become available in private hands. Amazing. Wow. Wow. What, what is uh, this piece right here? For uh, this, this, this one's kind of cool. This is just a meteorite right in the background. I'm temporarily storing here. Let me put it to the side. But this, <laughs> this, this titanium, solid titanium ring, I mean, literally machine titanium the whole way around, is a docking ring. It's, notice it says Apollo 14 docking ring. Mm -hmm. In the Smithsonian, literally the National Air and Space Museum, it's in their inventory list as the Apollo 14 docking ring. And if you look the Apollo 14 spacecraft, there is, this is missing, but, the, but it's but not it, that easy. It, it, it's left behind. The actual Apollo 14 in every Apollo mission uh -huh. docking ring is left behind on the final detach from the lunar module. So after successful you know, moon, moon operations, uh -huh. the lunar module comes up, docks with the command module, yeah. astronauts go through, yeah. moon rocks go through, yeah. a couple souvenirs from the space program. <laughs> and then for the final detach, because they know they're not going to need that anymore, they, they fire an explosive wire just to shed this piece of weight. So this ring on every Apollo mission is left behind at the moon, does not uh -huh. come home. Uh -huh. So why did the Smithsonian get I confused? Yeah. Well, on Apollo 14, which is right after Apollo 13, there were five attempted failures in a row to dock on the way to the moon. Because the way, you know, you, you have the whole stack heading to the moon, yeah. on the way there, you have to reorient. You, you reorient, you come out, yeah. you, you, you dock and you pull the lunar module out. They just couldn't do it. And so everything had a mimic on Earth. So this is the sister unit built at the same time yeah. in the same manner as the Apollo 14 ring huh. and was extensively used in ground testing to try to recreate the problem. Yeah. And they could not recreate it on Earth. Well, and so they tried things like pull the drogue out and just hit it harder and they eventually got it to hit. But they were, they were debating like, you know, if we can't undo it, yeah, it's going to be do? tricky. Yeah. Um, it's going to be an embarrassing failure. We have this whole stack and we can't undo it. And uh, luckily everything worked fine from that point on. They don't know why. Huh. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Unsolved mystery. But it's kind of like, I, I like it visually, it's like the portal through which <laughs> we go through. Yeah. This actually is also related. This uh, would be the command module side of the hatch. The, I, don't, I have it perched a little precariously, but this opens and that's how you uh, get through the hatch yeah. once you have a connection. Wow. It's flown Soyuz deck, the whole thing. Kind of crazy that uh, this archaic <laughs> Manual stuff. Manual dial, dials, yeah. <laughs> yeah for... <laughs> Isn't that wild? And, and, and like a globe. And, and I like the way the, 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 uh, the numbers change. If you're doing an 80 amp 
or 40 amp uh, range. So instead of having multiple scales, yeah. they literally just changed the numbers. I think that was kind of creative. <laughs> All electromechanical. Recently, um, I lent, I have the, like this is almost the oldest version. The only thing that's newer is this is a digital clock. Mm -hmm. And separately, there's this guy online I can point you to that has the most amazing analysis taking this thing apart and getting it to work. Again, just this module is incredibly complex. And, and I had the older analog clock version. The, the non-digital uh, version? The non-digital, yeah, electromechanical version. Yep. Yeah. And it's simpler and, and arguably has more features. This digital thing is so full of weird, old, custom Soviet electronics and, and chips. Hmm. It's weird. And then uh, this flew in the Vokshad program. This is a parachute uh, cover in 1964. It, it was kind of crazy element of risk taking on the Soviet part mm -hmm. in that um, they wanted to be the first to send two people to space. In fact, they did three. Um, they wanted to beat Gemini. And they kind of figured out Gemini, you know, means twins, means two people going to space. Like there was no secret that America was trying with the first Gemini flight yeah. to be, to win at least something first. Because right. the Russia was getting first this, first that, first satellite, first human in space, first woman in space. <laughs> and they won this one too, but it was a wild crash effort. They took a spacecraft that was never designed for three astronauts. It was so crowded they couldn't wear spacesuits. Essential controls were behind their head. They had to use like mirrors on their wrist to figure what? out how to control. Yeah, and they, they made one of the key designers fly on the mission to make give people comfort it would be okay because he was the designer, he's flying on the mission. Yeah. And it came back horribly ballistic. I mean, it survived, but it, like all kinds of stuff failed. Parachutes failed, systems failed. This is why this got removed for study is because the parachute, uh, the, 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 the deployment deploy. system failed. Yeah. And like three days later, they flew the humans. They're like, oh, yeah, we're ready to go. Without so any fixes? Six, six days later. Without so. any fixes? Well, yeah, no, they're like, I think yeah, we, yeah, we, okay. we got it figured out. Yep. Just a, yeah. Insane, right? <laughs> Okay, let's come around here in my office. Oh, we'll, we'll come back to my office later when we get to SpaceX, but I want to move to over here for a sec. Oh, the RL-10 engine hut, we not <laughs> mention that. This is the <laughs> With the regen channels again? Exactly. Yeah. Let's see how the, and when this thing's firing at full thrust, it's hotter than the sun on the inside, but icicles form simultaneously on the right, way, right. which is kind of amazing. Um, let's switch over to here for a sec. This is, uh, we won't go into this because your first video covered it nicely, but this is the lunar module flight computer. It's incredibly huge. Yep. And on the other side is a little gimbal, two axis, um, inertial measurement unit, all the compute is down here. And this one comes from the uh, LM2, the one that's in the National Air and Space Museum. Mm -hmm. This is the flight computer for that lunar module, which never flew because LM1 did its job just fine. Yeah. We won't go through all these things, but you can see on this, in, in the shelf, there's just all kinds of flown artifacts. I pulled a couple out just to show you. Um, when I said I had a part of every lunar module that's been to the moon, this is the armrest from Apollo 17. <laughs> the lunar module. armrest. Mm -hmm. It's weird. It has this thing that looks like a cushion. Yeah. But it's not. It's all metal, very lightweight. And I thought it had something to do with how you put your arm. No, but uh -huh. I, I learned from Oh, it's the inverted. Rest. Yeah. This is how you, you have a joystick. Yeah. I would have thought maybe that it was because of ergonomic angle or something from the other side. But. No, isn't that weird? This is, I think the only reason it's sloped like this is if your knee bumps up, it won't hit. It'll sort of like it deflects the side. So right? they really so thought of everything, right? It's like a guess. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And so uh, that was from Gene Cernan. A leftover piece of potato soup, food from Apollo 13. They had to preserve water, and, uh, and you know, and they basically went with a lot of only. They didn't eat the hydrated meals on that mission. This was Buzz Aldrin's flashlight that he wore on his leg for the first two EVAs that he did um, on the Gemini program and uh, covered with Velcro again, so he could <laughs> just stick to his leg, and he, he used it on that mission, on, yep. on his Gemini flight. This comes from the Apollo 16 lunar module. It's called the Crewman Optical Alignment Sight. Basically, it projects onto this 45 degree, beautiful piece of treated glass, a yeah. uh, crosshair or a reticle, yeah. and you put it in the window, and you look through this, and it lines up on the crosshair on the opposing spacecraft. Yeah. So you have to have this to dock. If you don't have this in the window, you can't dock, because you yeah. can't see your docking ring. Yeah. You have to use this, to figure out where you're gonna, you know, to connect. Wow. So this was used as an essential element of the lunar, of, of the lunar landing on Apollo 16, and John Young brought it back as a souvenir. Wow! It's actually the first artifact I collected. That's like the wow. original, your original mm -hmm. space artifact. How could you own something like that? <laughs> Let me put this to the side. I'll stay on Apollo for one more moment. I love John Young, and one of his most famous photos, probably the second most famous photo in the space program. Well, I won't grab it. Is where he's doing the jump salute, and he's like three feet off the lunar surface, saluting the camera. Well, he had this on his wrist when he did that. It has instructions for taking samples. You notice it's kind of hard to turn these plasticized pages because uh -huh. the, the curvature of the arm yep. makes it so that you know, they're not going to flop around. Yeah. And so they have all of the instructions for everything you do wow. with even handwritten corrections. 
This was used on Apollo 16, and it was on his wrist during that famous jump shot. Wow. It's kind of amazing. That's one of my favorite artifacts. Yeah. Right. So here we have some metal meteorites in various places, but I just want to show you what you can see about our universe on the rocks that come flying towards Earth. This is the largest slice, or at least it was at the time, of the moon on Earth. I think it's clearly the most beautiful slice of the moon. <laughs> it comes from the center of uh, a rock that's bigger than anything the Apollo program brought back. And you can see the regolith, sort of the, the white and the gray are similar. Um, they've been smashed together from impactors, and the gray is like three times denser than the white. And you have full grain structures yes. of metal in there, too. Exactly. So some iron nickel, probably like one of these boys, came slamming into the moon, maybe during the late heavy bombardment, and um, infused all the cracks with molten metal, like yeah. under very high pressure. Wow. And then they can do various analyses of co cosmic ray exposure times to figure out how long, unbelievably, how long was this rock sort of under the lunar surface and not exposed to cosmic rays? Basically, you know, the proton shooting out of the sun. How long was it just sitting as a loose rock on the surface? And then how long was it dislodged and floating and tumbling, basically on even exposure? And how, how did they do that again? So they look at um, basically these little tiny vesicles that form when a solar wind hits the object in space without any shielding of atmosphere or anything else. If it's under some other rocks, it won't happen. It's only the okay. surface. Of yeah, it. yeah. It's kind of amazing. Yeah. So you get a sense of how long it was. I think this was dislodged from the moon only 2,000 years ago. Um, and uh, Relative it, to us, that's yeah, a long time ago, right? Exactly. Because <laughs> well, some of this stuff's really old, like this rock. <laughs> yeah, that rock. <laughs> EC002, it was recently determined, only last month, or earlier this month, rather, to be the oldest volcanic rock by far anywhere in our solar system, a million years older than any predecessor. I had it sliced in half so you can see the incredible crystals that form deep within a planetary sky sail body. This formed before Earth. This is older than everything on Earth. It's when our solar system was first forming. Something got big enough to be like a planet in scale. We have gravitational separation of a molten core, rocky mantle, and then something else smashed it to completely the oblivion, so it doesn't even exist anymore wow. in our solar system. Yeah. I, I looked with a macro zoom at all these little vesicles. It, uh -huh. it is full of crystals all the way down. It's like 60% quartz. It's insane. Wow. It's like an earth rock, but yeah. it's older than but earth. It's not, and it's not earth. It's yeah. older than earth, yes. Wow. It's oh, kind yeah. of amazing. They're still studying it, and we'll hope to learn more. But I think it's the most gorgeous meteorite by far. It's just sure. covered with these green gemstones that when you light them up from behind, it looks like kryptonite. Yeah. We went a few orders of magnitude and age there, huh? Between mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and by the way, if you want to collect things, palisites like that, um, you know, a mixture of stone and mantle, you can get these quite regularly. This one's called Admire. That's beautiful. It's, it's I'm sure with the Kansas. bad light, that would oh, be yeah. stunning. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's any way to see it. Yeah, yeah sort of, wow. Can you sort of see that? Yeah, the amber hue. Uh -huh. yeah. Those are uh, peridot or olivine. They're space gems. And again, this was something that could have been a planet. It had enough gravity to isolate the metal and the rock, and it cooled in zero gravity so that even though they're very different in density, they didn't separate all the yeah. rock in one place, all the metal. Sure. And the metal itself has these crystalline patterns that can only form when you cool by a few degrees centigrade every million years. And it forms these incredible every patterns. Every million, million years. years. Actually, Several. we'll just briefly look at it here. Just, you can see it clearly on this one. This oh, wild yeah. mix yeah, of yeah. three-dimensional uh, crystals and, and uh, yeah, crystal orientations going all through each other. It takes an incredible long time. I noticed that uh, your, your uh, ring is also a meteor, oh, yes. right? Exactly, this one is as well. Yeah. I love it. Things that could only be made in space, could not be made on Earth. Impossible. Unbelievable. Yeah, you need zero gravity. Several degrees. And, you, and just, like, you, you Over can't keep something of years. that, yeah, you couldn't control it for that long. No one has their patience. <laughs> okay, so. Well, longest experiment, right? Well, switch to some modern stuff here at the end. Which I love. Well, first let's look overhead. This is a flown arrow cover, literally scorched from it, an explosion that occurred in McGregor, Texas, when the board of directors of SpaceX was watching the F9R, the Falcon 9 reusability development vehicle, a thing they were there testing vertical take off landing for the first time. Yeah. This thing went up, started to arc over, there was some sensor error. It had to be uh, terminated with almost full fuel. Yeah. It's in there, it's Massive in that video, book. right? Mm -hmm. the, the kaboom? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I, I have some video clips that I took in there. I Elon, like, looking over the strewn field. And someone tried to cheer him up by saying, you know, well, gosh, if you don't fail, you aren't learning some quote of either Edison or, or I forget who um, back in the day. And he's like, you know, given the options, I'd prefer to learn from success. <laughs> sure. <laughs> this is like with what he had on the line. Gotcha. Right? Yeah, exactly. Then this, this explosion, um, interestingly, oh, this is, by the way, it's another piece of that. Talking nine development vehicle, like when they're testing landing legs coming down for the first time. Uh, this again is what, just a piece which of wreckage. Falcon 9? This is the F9R, the thing. The that F9R, yeah. got it. Yeah, so it was never meant to go to space. It was meant to test.
vertical takeoff and landing, but mm -hmm. I just love that. Yeah. Now this explosion, pretty amazing, is an Antares uh, rocket that blew up um, on the east coast at Wallops, and I mean it just. That's amazing with the mm -hmm. the scale of the what is that? Yeah, a like a water tower, tower? Yeah. exactly. Somewhere, one of these little specks is this satellite. This Planet Lab satellite emerged unharmed. The next morning, when the sun came up on the beach and it lit up the solar panels, they were able to find it. And, like it was fully operational. So this is a three U cube set. This mm -hmm. is Planet Labs. Um, these Go these on. wings are also covered with solar cells on the other side. Yep. And uh, they realized they should put the wings on the upside and have the whole thing and one of the panels on yep. one thing. So the yep. later designs flipped where those are in a pretty obvious way. But it's just a commercial off-the-shelf telescope embedded with lithium-ion cells along the side. Off the oh, by the way, this this originally was just a, a, sni a properly snipped length looks of... Looks like a um, blade. Uh, mm -hmm. Hacksaw blade? Yeah, it, 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 this one looks like that. The original was just from like a tape measure. Just you could, like measure how many inches you need <laughs> for S-band or X-band and boom, there you go. Wow. Yep. This is a prototype build of the Apollo 11 flag. It, they didn't... Oh, oh, yeah. By the way, here's that jump shot of John Young I referenced earlier. Oh, that's right. There is, you know, you can see a shadow down here. Yeah. And, you know, people would say, oh, my God, it's faked. But no, he's jumping in the air. <laughs> <laughs> with, that arm, with the arm thing on his things. So this, by the way, is the, the prototype build of the, the Apollo 11 flag. Mm -hmm. It separates here. I interviewed Buzz Aldrin about it and got him to sign it. Yeah. It pivots here. This one has all the failures of that one. Notice it sags. Yep. The, the, and, and the whole reason it's such a contraption is there was no room for a, lunar, for a flag in the lunar module. Like literally months before Apollo 11, they were, the, the Congress they was like, we're, we're not going to do a UN flag, we're going to put a US flag on the moon. And JPL and, and everyone was like, no, we don't, there's just, space, yeah. the Grumman engineers, they're like, there's no room, no, no place in the lunar module for it. And they're like, no, yes, yeah. so back and forth. So they had to roll it up, design something that detaches and rolls up into a tube, uh -huh. and they strapped it on the leg. So all the flags on the moon were strapped to the legs of the lunar lander. And this one blew over at launch. So, you notice how the leg here, you see the shadow? Yes. They saw it blow over as they took off. And on the way back to Earth, had a conversation. Buzz told me, I had this all on video. Neil and he said, you know, we don't need to tell the American population right away that the flag is no longer flying on the moon. <laughs> they waited like over a decade before sharing that, just within NASA. Unbelievable. Yeah. Wow. So that flag does not exist on the moon. Yeah. It's been destroyed uh, and bleached. OK, so, so here's one. Mm -hmm. Take a look in the restroom. Oh, the restroom? Uh, we'll, just, we'll just make a pass. Yeah, yeah, that's true. He knows. Cause, Anyone who's used the restroom here, we, each, each restroom is full of space artifacts, of course. <laughs> These are maps that were used on the lunar rover. Uh, literally, when this one was the one in the route they took when they found that orange soil that's, that's not a, an artifact that actually is orange um, soil on the moon. Because of uh, I don't know what iron? it is, but it's something oxidized. Yeah, uh, maybe it's iron. I'm not sure. But it's bizarre because everything else is the same gray. Yeah. I, I, I know what that is. Um, used on the very first lunar rover, Apollo 15, Apollo 17. Mm -hmm. These scissors were used on the rover on Apollo 17, and they Four. dropped into the same thing. They, they use them for all kinds of stuff. It's like carrying a pocket knife. Okay. They needed to open their food. And in this one, it's all in the transcript between Cern and Schmidt that, that it had dropped and lost in the sand, uh, in the, in the, um, in the dust of the yeah. lunar regolith. And they like, you better find that or you're not going to eat. <laughs> so they, like, they, they went, yeah. you know. <laughs> so this was literally on the lunar surface, almost lost in the lunar surface, yeah. and some other maps from <laughs> Apollo 16 and 17. So yeah, we'll do more. I love this. The first electric vehicle on the moon. There'll be more on Mars and the moon. You know, electric vehicles. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Artemis missions, right? Yeah. You're not gonna have an internal combustion engine. <laughs> As we pass by here, I'll just mention literally rocket components from 1926 from Goddard. Yeah, a, ba a, a fuel baffle and half of a ceramic nozzle. And that little model just reminds you what the rocket looked like. It was the gold part. So the gold part would launch up and off of the frame, which is the black part. Unbelievable. And then a, a later a experimental bell that he's working with as well. Awesome. Kind, of, kind of amazing. Our godfather. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, how can we pass this? Literally, handle from the Apollo 11 spacecraft, the outside of the <laughs> command module. This is, uh, during Gemini, by the way, I've been reading about this, they had all kinds of trouble in their spacewalks seeing without handles and, and, and orienting. They didn't, they didn't put handles in the spacecraft. So one of the things the Apollo introduced was, let's put handles and let's put these glow-in-the-dark tabs. There's four of them okay. that are super bright that you can't miss and they don't need electricity because they have this Promethium-147, believe okay. it or not. Um, yeah, good, yes, a radioactive material yeah. that li lights it up. And so all of the handles of every Apollo spacecraft have been destroyed as radioactive waste. And any 
thing in the you know, Smithsonian and everyone has a replacement face. Mm -hmm. This is the only one that still exists. It's from Apollo 11. With the original. With, uh, everything's original. Well, 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 with, with the original. With the original, yeah, yeah. With the original radioactive. <laughs> by the way, the half life's two and a half years. So by that was now. A long time ago. Yeah, I mean, we were like a million X less. Two and a half years. Yeah, is that very quickly. Right yeah, yeah, so it degrades yeah, very sure. quickly. Yeah. And it's, by the way, it's not, it's not a radioactive risk to us being near it. It's if you ingest it. It's like polonium. Okay. It's a poison if you swallow it. Okay. So this guy at Johnson Space Center said, look, and he has a signed contract with Chris Kraft. I will study this for 20 years at my expense to see if there's any danger of these things, and my only payment will be I get to keep the handle. At the end of the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, there was no problem. <laughs> sure, sure. So this was worn by Buzz Aldrin on the moon um, in Apollo 11. It's the under glove to, uh, under their uh, external gloves. Mm. This is a space shuttle, an inertial government, kind of like you compare <laughs> the, the lunar ball that's in here for two axis acceler uh, two axis gimbal accelerometer and then uh, there's one in here for the space shuttle. Then I'm saving some of the best for last. Mercury <laughs> space suit, amazing. It, it doesn't last as well over the years. It's, it's not as shiny as it used to be. Sure. My favorite new artifact. This literally is the, the it's basically the, the initial hatch that blows for the parachute retrieval system, the drogue and then the main for SpaceX. It has the SpaceX logo on it. So just as a reminder, this is that piece of the spacecraft. Right, that pops <laughs> off and then these, ca these uh, cords go around this and then the chute comes out. Yeah. It was attached to the space station. This is the one that took the first two humans, Doug and Bob, into space. So it was SpaceX's first human flight, this Sitting right was here. a thing that yep. if it didn't pop off, they aren't, coming, they aren't coming home. And it has these really powerful springs. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, come, come, look, come look behind here. Holy. Solid smoke. titanium spring with two, two different counter Yeah. Springs. Wow. Double That's helix. Unbelievable. Yeah. Oh wow, so that's pre-compressed. Do you know how yeah, much force? Oh yeah, insane amount of force. It still has a bit of force in there. You wouldn't want to... Yeah, you wouldn't want to yeah, yeah, touch it and... You're exactly right. It stores <laughs> an immense amount of energy. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll skip the artifacts in here. Oh, actually, I'll... Uh, well, I'll, show you one. I'll show you one. We'll, do a, we'll just do a walkthrough. I'll try not to get distracted here. A spare exercise bike from uh, Skylab. And what I love about the Skylab um, exercise bikes. It came with the shoe? No, I got these several. These are Rusty Schweikart's uh, <laughs> training these shoes. Yep. Um, they invented this clip, and at first I thought, wow, you know, this is crazy. You know, when did Shimano first invent bike clips? Why would you build a fairly heavy, feel how heavy the shoe is, a fairly heavy wow. custom yeah. triangular thing? And I thought, you know, that's kind of kludgy. I mean, everything here, by the way, looks like a big kludgy version uh -huh. of what you're used to on uh -huh. modern bicycles, right? So uh -huh. why would they, oh, by the way, in all the knobs, or like you'd have in the lunar module. <laughs> They're just like heart rate yeah. <laughs> instead of descent rate. Um, so why would you have this triangle? And then I saw this amazing photo of the inside of Skylab. All of the floors are a triangular mesh. So you can, wearing these exercise shoes, snap in anywhere at any of 60 degree angles because it's basically a grid of triangles. Right. So when, if you want to like in zero gravity, right, you want to work, you want your shoes to be snapped in, mm -hmm. the entire floor, you can connect with this triangle. How, how does that quick disconnect work? So it just goes in. Well, kind of like our, our, our normal, yeah, and, you just, and then yeah, wow. then that's nice and attached. Yeah, yeah, wow. Let's see, someone's calling me. I'm gonna hit stop. That's funny. That was a call from the UAE of all things. Uh, <laughs> UAE. <Yeah. laughs> rover uh, schematics that also went on the rovers, but we won't talk. This thing flew uh, to the Mir space station. It's scorched on the other side, but it's rush flown Russian stuff. Another piece of wreckage, by the way, from F9R from that, that earlier conversation we had. Yep. Oh, this is a lunar module landing leg. That's how no. big it was. Yeah. So that ball at the top is where the pad would be that lands on the moon. Yeah. This one shows how far it compressed because inside of it was a single-use shock absorber. It was an aluminum honeycomb structure. Oh, yeah. It's no exactly one way. Yeah. 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 It, just, it just compresses once. Yeah. This has all this gunk on it for where they had glued all these pressure sensors and vibration sensors. So this one was used extensively in testing. And I have a whole bunch. I'm going to try to reassemble the whole landing gear I have tucked away all over the place here, bits and pieces of it. Uh, try to build the astronaut farmer. So I'll show you one last thing in my office, and then maybe we'll call it a day. Mm -hmm. uh, an engine from Viking, we were talking about Viking earlier. That's what the Viking, the red part is just the frame. That's like the uh, the engine that takes you to Mars that, that uh, was a spare from the yeah. Viking, Viking program. Sure. And then, uh, oh, this is kind of cool. These are handwritten engineering notes for the Apollo 11. They didn't know that this would be Apollo 11 at the time, just LM5. And then at the end of this whole program, George Lowe basically says, uh, 
this is very likely to be the lunar module to land on the moon. It should be. And whoever was there in the meeting was like, big exclamation. <laughs> yeah, that's but, the important note. <laughs> but what it is, and I've had this whole thing scanned and open for anyone who wants it to look at, is all of the day shift to night shift handoffs of things that were bedeviling them. Like what? What and, are the yeah. cruxes, yeah. And normally engineers don't necessarily document everything they're struggling with, and, but they had to because every day shift had to hand off to the night shift. And they actually had to write in a, in a handwriting you can read because someone else was using it yeah. literally that same day. I need to change it. So there's like all kinds of guidance. Like somewhere in here, there'll be things like, do not energize these circuit breakers. So they had to warn the night shift that there was anything left. So you, you can get a peek into the development. And I can tell you, looking through this, it's all about batteries and electrical systems. It, it wasn't like a mechanical thing doesn't fit. It yeah. was, it just, I mean, it was entirely new black art. How do you get the, basically the, the, the power systems to work? Yeah. And um, I also noticed, I, I created a spreadsheet of all the work days. They basically worked every weekend. They, they got like three days off for 4th of July and that was it. Wow. Yeah. Um, wow. And they would complain about their um, personal life. Yeah, yeah you have yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, personal anecdotes in there too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so why don't we end, I got this in my office with you know, some more meteorites, some engines, various things over there, but this is kind of fun to end with. This is a uh, wreckage from this SN8 starship. So recent, unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. So the skirt and a pressure, one. yeah, mm -hmm. oh yeah, too much. So this, yeah, so you can see it, is, uh, and I can show you the photo of this later where this, this covers various items. This uh, valve is used commonly throughout. And then I also have in here other wreckage, these mm -hmm. beam mm -hmm. or girders just completely worked from the crash in this thing. Like they were a uh, water jet cut, those. Yeah. So it's just from oh, the striations. Oh, I was wondering if there's a 3D print, does it look like water jet? Yeah, it, yeah, or laser cut. Yeah, like the, the surface. Yeah, mm -hmm. the surface was. And this one says Starship on it, just above the 001. It says high pressure Starship, which is kind of <laughs> yeah. cool. Little detail. Yeah. It's a bang bang valve, very simple valve that's used, to, yeah. used throughout. It's modern day uh, artifacts, right? Exactly. Well, this is part of a Titan wreckage from Vandenberg Air Force Base. I haven't shown this anywhere yet because someone actually scavenged it on the Air Force Base, uh, <laughs> and it's part of a, you know, basically one of our <laughs> missile systems. Titan that blew up at, at Vandenberg. Make sure that I don't want that to fall over. So I'm gonna, I might create a wreckage section because <laughs> I have yeah. pieces of the Mercury One that went up five feet and then blew up. And yeah, we just put this down here. For it's kind of amazing how heavy some of this stuff is. Right. It's supposed to be flight grade, but it is. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if there's anything else really. We can, we can sort of end with that and say, this is the Future Ventures Space Museum. It keeps growing. You can see there's limited room to keep growing. Gonna have to expand um, somehow, right? Yeah, actually, yeah. yeah. pan back over to where we came from. We never did the chairs. Let's, let's end with the chairs. Let's end with the chairs. Because uh, next time we do a video, I may have something new to show you. Um, so this would be in the Apollo couch in the command module, just as a reminder of people what we're talking about. The thing where you sit in there on your way to the moon and the way back. These chairs, by the way, fold down, so they, I was kind of wondering how do you make room? So once you've launched and you don't need the chair anymore, the thing folds and tucks out of the way. Huh. It's kind of cool, like yeah. it, it hinges here and down here. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Neil Armstrong would have sat in this position. I separately collected these, these hand controllers. And during takeoff, one of, the, one of the special features of this thing is that if you do that, it's an abort. So he had his hand on this during yeah, the Yeah, don't, don't, that, don't flick your hand. That's the thing with those, the solid rocket boosters, the red tip yeah. takes. The whole thing, wait, that, that's all it That's all it needed. For an abort. No, no, no yeah. like, uh, you know, mm -hmm. usual cover switch or anything. Just and normally, and then later, on the way to the moon, they switch seats and Michael Collins sits here and does the very ca uh, cautious docking maneuver. He was very proud, that was his biggest moment. Uh -huh. Apollo 11 uh -huh. was operating this. Uh, but normally, uh, Neil Armstrong was using this to basically fly the spacecraft. So he flew both the command module and lunar module. Wow. I'm negotiating and next time you'll probably be able to see I, I have the Apollo 11 versions of these en route, which is uh, the, literally the, the ones that Neil Armstrong used. Wow. Yeah, which is a whole other question of you know, how that came to be. Yeah. So, <laughs> I love this, the whole couch seems like a good place to end. Yeah. Uh, on that Saturn V uh, flight computer, which I'm gonna disassemble, or at least show the insides of it, it's gorgeous. Yeah, and, sure. And normally you don't see spherical computers. Yeah, you know, it does not look like a computer. Cylindrical, cylindrical computers. It does um, not look like a computer. No, but it's crazy on the inside, it's really beautiful. <laughs> so we'll take that apart as well nice. and show you what it looks like inside. Fantastic. So with that, we'll, we'll uh, get some lunch and say thank you very much for 
and letting us entertain you and yeah, entertain ourselves. I, we both really appreciate it. It's it. been so fantastic. Thank you very much, oh, Steve. Oh, thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs>